Let's talk. Call in radio. This is Let's Talk, Colin Radio, getting to the root causes of the important issues of the day. This on-the-air community forum believes your voice matters and welcomes all thoughts and views without judgment. Please join today's conversation by calling 415-663-8492 or 8317. And uh, your hosts today... I'm Paul Raphael. Good morning. Over this there is Stephen. is Stephen Hurwitz, and we have... Sally Phillips. Sally Phillips, perhaps you know of her. She is also joining us today. Shelley's on the road. Charles is on the road somewhere. He's back or he's around. I don't know. And perhaps later we'll be joined by Sebastian Alvarez. Perhaps we shall see. Anyway, today... This was spurred by an article. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. Every week it's the same thing. Well, you know, what are you going to do? Um, better than a dream. Exactly. Not necessarily. Uh, I knew you'd say that. <laughs> you set me up. Apparently, um, light pollution is getting worse. Light pollution. So this is caused by... Towns. We're talking about light pollution today. If you have any, um, if you have any uh, thoughts, opinions, solutions for light pollution, give us a call four one five six six three eight four nine two. And I was just shocked by the the fact that they calculate that one third of the world's population cannot see the Milky Way at night. Wow. One third of the population of the Earth. That's Can you see it? Over two billion people cannot see the Milky Way, including eighty percent of Americans and sixty percent of Europeans. And I'm going. Good heavens! This is last week we did. Sure, that makes sense, though. The most uh, populous areas. Yes. Western Europe, or or actually probably Eastern Europe as well, wherever there's just a lot of dense light lot from cities, which you can see when you fly over in an airplane. Yeah. You see these light clusters. And it's um, we talked about noise pollution last week, and light pollution is another form of pollution. Everyone, you know, don't really think about it very much because everyone's used to having street lights and blah, blah, blah. It's all powered by fossil fuels, too. Uh, it is. And a lot of it going to waste because a lot of that light is going to waste because the light fixtures are not necessarily shielded or lighting what they're supposed to light and only that, which causes these great looms over the city, the sky. What's it called? Sky glow. That's right. Um, the sky shed. The sky shared. Well, of course, it is the great commons in the sky. Is it is, and it's being uh, it's being shut down at night. Basically, we can't see the stars anymore. I think Pence is making a move to uh, to militarize it. This is a new <laughs> branch Space Force. of. New well, branch. they've got to give him something to do. Space Force. And probably just send all the brazen hussies uh, of the opposite sex into space and make them orbit. Oh, just forever. I see. Hmm. Yeah. That Until be the they stop ovulating or something crazy. Oh, yes, I that's see. what's going to happen. Excellent. You heard it here first, folks. Well, that's a, that's a great uh, political um, uh, 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 forecast. Um, Can so I give out the number one more please time? Please do. Slowly. <laughs> so if you want to call in and talk about your experiences or observations or thoughts about light pollution, you can call 415-663-8492 
or 415-663, is it 8317? Correcto. 8317, uh, because we'd love to hear from you on Let's Talk. Yes, okay. we are. Sorry um, to interrupt, Paul. It's, but um, I, it's another one of those things. It's another one of those subjects that we, you just become accustomed to not being able to see the sky. And what, is, what a loss that is. I mean, it's not, just, uh, it's not just that we're missing a pretty sky, those of us who don't live in the fog belt. You know, those <laughs> photographs of, uh, of places where you can see the sky exactly. are nothing short of fantastic. Fantastic. And the entire planet used to be that way. Now 80% of Americans do not see that at night unless they go to you know places like Joshua Tree or Yeah, there are five what they call dark spots in the United States. Ah, do tell. Yeah. Tell in us Utah, where they are. Yeah, can- the Canyonlands National Park, Death Valley National Park, California, Brockway Mountain in Michigan, of all places, mm. Denali National Park in Alaska, mm. George Washington and Jefferson in Virginia. That's surprising. Mm. And the Cherry Springs State Park in Pennsylvania. Huh. Well, there's also, uh, I mean, there are places that are dark sky, it is dark sky preserves. Uh, dark sky places, dark sky preserves and parks, protected zones around observatories. And uh, so there is, uh, let's see, also in California, Joshua Tree. Is a uh, is a dark spot, I believe. Yes, 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 yes. that's there right. Joshua Tree National Park and Death Valley National Park. They uh, they were both designated as uh, dark preserves, dark sky preserves. However, if you're thinking that you can go to the north rim of the Grand Canyon and see some stars, yeah. good luck, because no. what you're going to see is the glow of Las Vegas, which is. 175 miles away. Wow. So it's powerful. And the other night, uh, we were driving home from Petaluma. Yes. And I said, what is this glow in the sky? What am I seeing as it was, we're going west? And it it was the Coast Guard. Mm-hmm. Station. It was lights from the Coast Guard station. On Tamales Petaluma, right? Mucking with, yeah, m- sort of mucking with the loom. dark sky. Of all people, you'd think the Coast Guard, because you know, part of navigation, of course, used to be. Now, who needs who needs eyes anymore? Uh, you have GPS, but uh, used to be you would find out where you were from the loom of cities as you were coming close to a to a coast. And, and the one, stars, of course. And the stars, of course. The ultimate guy. Yes, exactly. I, for one, don't feel safe unless there's a lot of light. Well, now. Do tell. Do you have? Uh, you live on a fairly Actually, uh, isolated place. Do you have bright lights? And you know, uh, what the Pleiades? The uh, uh, last week, um, we were overcast, so we were searching for a good place to see them, and uh, heading towards Petaluma uh, that way was horrible. Mm. We never really did find a good space around here for so, to get away from yeah. the fog. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, but do you have bright lights in your – because I know that, you know, a lot of ranches are living in Marshall as I used to. You could look across to Point Reyes Peninsula and you could see – you couldn't actually see, I think it's H Ranch, the one that's closest to the end. But you can always see the loom, especially on a f- when there's a low overcast or fog coming in. You can see the bright lights of the corral lights that they have. I feel that it we're pretty dark actually when yeah. when there's no moon right. um, and th- until my eyes just uh you know just just if, <clears throat> whatever they do adjust yes that's what they do. <laughs> dilate <laughs> in I almost said that word <laughs> dilation yeah but um that's pretty, uh, and uh, you can see from the Marshall Wall, for example, you look out across Petaluma Valley and across Sonoma, Definitely. woof, yeah, Santa Rosa, Petaluma. Sonoma, you can see Sonoma, the loom of Sonoma. You down. know, um, they affect our health, too, all those lights. They really do. Do tell. They mess up with our circadian rhythms, and uh, uh, which one of the things is our sleep-wake cy- cycle, which is uh, turns out very important. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it uh, hormone release, eating habits, digestion, body temperature. Uh, these are all bodily functions that long-term sleep loss may affect. Yeah. Um, I won't go through the whole list, but there's lots of them. Uh, the hormone release is a big one. Melatonin. Yes, melatonin. Uh, Cell yeah. regeneration. Oh yeah. Oh, that's yeah. That's interesting. So these are this well, is part of m- modern life. Not necessary, as always. We make the make the uh, the what the disclaimer that we do live in a bubble out here, dark and fairly quiet. So these pollutions do not necessarily affect us, but they're affecting they affect us. the majority of people on the planet. Yeah. Well, all the things well, we no. have to treat. Well, people on the planet, a majority of Americans, anyway. They suck health care dollars. Uh, can, uh, circadian rhythms uh, affect insulin sensitivity, uh, of all things. Oh, lots of things. Yeah. Eye pressure. Eye pressure. So, uh, uh, wow, that's increasing interesting. Increasing eye pressure throughout the morning. Wow. It comes down throughout the day, and uh, those fluctuations from the light yeah. change all that. We have a call Hi, Cole. You're on the air. What's your name, please? And please, keep the language clean. Hi, Paul. This is Peggy Day calling from... Keep it Peggy clean, Peggy. Station. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Peggy. Hi. How are you? Very well. Um, boy, this is a good topic. Thank you. It's very timely right now because I live in Walnut Place in downtown Point Reyes Station. Ah. And I'm also on the Point Reyes Village Association. And I'm very aware of the Point Reyes community plan that was developed here maybe a couple decades ago, um, providing for the night sky, the nightscape, they call it. Mm, nightscape. There yes. And um, the, when one place got renovated, the, the, most of the people involved in the renovation, I'd say 99%, were from cities and not from... Point Reyes, and mm-hmm. um, somehow <laughs> this uh, regulation that we, pro- uh, I'm going to read this, the outdoor lighting shall serve the safety of ingress and egress, but shall not detract from the enjoyment of the natural nightscape. Somehow that got left behind. Uh, and um, so some of the lighting is penetrating the windows of the um, apartments, at least eight apartments. So that our night, it's interesting to hear you say that it affects insulin and it affects your eyes because um, there, most of us who are in these apartments that are having the light penetrate are having trouble sleeping. <laughs> yes. Wow. How about blackout curtains? Are those being necessitated? Well, you know, I, I just purchased some at my own expense and I was told mm. that I could use them, but only if they couldn't be seen from the outside of the building. Oh, come on now. What? Yeah. Okay. The, uh, at night. That's... It's a little late, though. It's a little late. The circadian well, it seems that they need to mitigate the problem, not me. <laughs> no. but, but so this is from street lighting or from lighting at well, there's two things. Walnut Place. Walnut Place in the front is lit up like a Walnut Walmart parking lot right now. Um, oh, really, it's so intense that um, it, it penetrates the building from the front. But I live in the back, and so there's a different kind of lighting that penetrates in the back. So I could talk about the front because um, EAH, uh, uh, Ecumenical Housing Association, that owns this property has already begun to address the problem in the front, and they've hired a contractor to um, totally redo, tear down all the the lighting fixtures, the, wow. the posts and everything, and replace the lighting in the front so that it conforms more to the point raised plan. Right. But um, the back is now... The, the issue that eight of us are concerned about because there are eight apartments that it's penetrating. So, so this was uh, so the designs were done by uh, not local people, or they right. didn't pay attention to local guidelines. Let's put it that way. Right. Well, you know, they had to pass it through the village association for approval, mm. and um, it isn't a regulatory approval, but um, certainly the um, supervisors are, are influenced. But um, the Village Association wasn't aware of the intensity of the direction of these lights yeah. until they were in. And yeah. 
So the Village Association has kind of been tackling this project because lights are not, uh, let me find the part, lights are not, the um, the lights should be low wattage, hooded, and cast downward. Right. So none of those exist in the back here or in the front. Wow. Yeah, and is this that, an yeah. issue, do you think, oh, sorry, Paul, of, yeah. of um, avoiding a litigious a, a, a situation of uh, someone not, oh, yeah. someone perhaps falling and, you, and injuring themselves because even, of insufficient yeah, light? Moral and ethical responsibility, they're concerned about that, and we acknowledge that, that there's, you know, they, they have to provide safe ingress and egress here, and they're aware of that, but I think it's been... Um, I think it's sort of overarching. Overarching, in turn, including, um, says the light picture should not, should be eight feet or below, um, and some of these lights are up 20 feet high and, and, wow. and wow. casting sideways yeah. into apartments. So. Wow. It's shocking. Well, there it is. That is the perfect illusion. And I did not know about this. So that is a well, thank you, Paul, piece of news. No, but so <laughs> can, do you know if they're, uh, if they're LED lights? Do you know? Yes, I do. Yeah. They are. Yeah. There you go. But That's you know, what's the, doing it. So, you, uh, so LEDs are so much cheaper to run that they put in more powerful and more of them. That's what cities are doing all over the place and in they, towns. They don't. They can't be directed downward, apparently. Oh well, they can. I mean, they they can be hooded if you hooded, have the right yeah. uh, the right light fixtures. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah there are some. Uh, there's some half half hoods on them, but mm. the, they don't prevent them from going into the apartments. And the other thing about LED lighting is that it's uh, most of them, unless they, unless the people installing them are very careful, they emit blue light, and blue light is the most harmful to uh, human health and probably for wildlife. Who knows? But certainly oh, disruptive. Be read about that to know whether or not blue know. light tells our body uh, uh, it's morning. Let's get up. Let's get going. Yeah. Oh, four o'clock every morning. <laughs> That's when you wake up. I wake up. Yeah. Oh boy. And I haven't had a good night's sleep since this, uh, since they they finished putting in the lighting, which I can't remember how long ago mm. that was. So it's harmful to your health. It's not just yeah. illumination. So uh, the American Medical Association in 2016 issued a report. Uh, they expressed concern about exposure to blue light from outdoor lighting and recommends shielding all light fixtures and only using lighting with 3,000K color temperature and below. So I guess that's in the lower range of the spectrum. So you're t more towards the red or the yellow, perhaps, than the blue. Wow. Well, that is a, uh, a, a, a scary story, and um, I, I'm sorry that you've had to go through this. It seems like activism never stops, right? You know, I'm sorry for interrupting, but mm. uh, the Dance Palace, don't they have better lighting? It's, I don't know. It's low. You walk through the walk. It's very low. Oh, light. on the paths. Yeah. yeah. Is there lighting out the back? I don't know. I don't know. Mm. Well, yeah, some yeah, towns... don't have high hiding, lighting up in the dance palace. Mm. They, so, in the new Health and Herb Human Services building, they actually put in um, a high entry light. And it's not motion detector, so it's on 24-7. Mm. And that penetrates oh, really? into walnut place bedrooms That's as well. terrible. What are they thinking? Yeah, it's, I, I, I find it really interesting and shocking that they mm. would leave out such an important component in their planning of that extensive remodel. Right. Well, thanks for that Thank call, you, Peggy. Peggy. You're welcome. I appreciate the call. It's good to know. And at, we, uh, uh, senior lunch. Good luck with the, with the activism. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Thanks. Thank you, Bye. everybody. Bye-bye. And we have another caller. Hi, caller. You're on the air. What's your name, please? And keep it clean. Hello, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Trying to push pause. Here we go. Ah. Hey, this is Gail. Hi, Gail. How are you? We're all well here. We're in a very brightly lit studio, but we seem to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay, give me a minute. Um, ah. You okay? Good. Here it is. Yeah, I was oh. just looking for something. She was blinded by the light. <laughs> yes. I thought that... that, that the comments by the last caller were amazing on two fronts. One, that so much attention, in fact, was actually paid to managing 
the lighting, you know, and being aware of its effects on sleep. I think a lot of people just aren't. Right. Um, and, of course, the frustration, you know, uh, of watching it just being pushed by the wayside and then the results of it. Um, I'm just looking at a quote. It says, humans evolved on a planet without electric light over thousands, thousands of generations. We're designed to be alert and awake during the daytime and to sleep at night. We now have a 24-7 society that isn't in harmony with our biologic design. Mm. Um, there are a lot of things that are suggested for people either who have lights from their um, surroundings. You know, like when I go to visit my mom's house, I mean, that front room is, it's daylight, you know, 24-7 wow. because of the lights that are right outside on the walkway. Mm. But um, the black blockers, you know, the light blockers actually do make a big difference. Um, mm. Covering up computer lights or covering over, you know, electronic lights, that may just be going to let you know those things are all ready. You know, that's a good and, point. Um, we look at our the, computers mm-hmm. before right, we Right, but the screen time, blue in light. other words, your, your blue lights are from your... So basically, the notion is that typically, you know, we had daylight, so you wake up in the morning, you walk outside, you know, the sun hits your retina actually in your skin, and it gives your body the signal that it's time that you're up. It's mm. daytime, you're awake. And then as it becomes darker, you know, people might traditionally have been around firelight, but that would be the only source of light as we evolved. So that's the red and the yellow lights you're talking about. And so blocking the blue and now even some of the green spectrums they find do a lot to get back to the normal cycles of, the, of melatonin production and the normal sleep cycles. There are glasses that are blue blockers that can be gotten, you know, that need to that can shield your eyes. Um, there's a program that you can put on your computer. It's called Flux, but it's F dot lux dot com, which will make the screen. It will take the blue light out of your screen, and it'll be synchronized oh. to the daylight cycles. If you watch television, though, or just sitting around the house with the lights on, wearing the blue blockers, can do a lot towards at least moving towards that more natural rhythm. So, you know, the suggestion is to stop using your screen for an hour or two before bedtime, and yes. if you are on the screen, take to use this program or the blue blocker lights to at least, you know, start to restore um, the rhythm. And so it's, you know, I think F dot Lux dot com. That's the, that's good to know. Yeah, I feel, I think that's, that's so helpful, Gail. I think that looking at a computer as I'm doing right now, and I do for so many hours per day, uh, sometimes I get terrible vertigo and I'm beginning to think that sometimes I can really directly attribute it to um, the light emanating from the computer screen that's just upsetting my eyes and um, causing that st- stress there. Oh, uh, I, and in the evening I feel like I can barely focus if I'm on the computer too long. I mean, there's no doubt that the days that I get up, take a walk, do my exercise, you know, hack in the garden and maybe work for an hour or two or intermittently are a thousand percent better, you know, than the ones where I'm really stuck in front of the screen, um, you know, for extended periods of time or just forcing myself to finish some project at night or something. Yeah, so if we include in light pollution the light from computers and other devices, pretty ubiquitous. Well, you know, in some ways, those are the greatest because, I mean, I can come into my home theoretically and have some control over the night, you know. I mean, yeah. not in this situation of one left place perhaps right now, but in general. Um, but then mm. we turn on the TV, right, right. on the computer, uh, exactly. and here we are, worst, the worst of the worst. The, mm. the TV is quite um, a perpetrator of uh, problematic illumination and, and and hey go into a sports bar where there are like 20 monitors i mean that's oh, just plain <laughs> sickening i don't yeah. know how anyone can sit in a bar with a bunch anyone. of monitors it just <laughs> freaks me and out it's one of my pet peeves that i have expressed on this show before that so many shows news shows like fox news all the news programs 
And all the sports shows have this bright blue background, fluorescent blue background yeah. going on, and changing and shifting in the background. Why? I guess it beca- because it attracts your attention, obviously. That must be yeah. why they're doing it. I mean, all those rhythms, you know, all those lights are literally designed to disrupt us, to keep us, mm. you know, on edge, like on attention. I mean, it's actually mm. the depth of the changes that we're exposed to, both in sound and in light are very intentional and, and mm. effective, you know, because it's almost a subliminal change. Yep. Yeah, but, some, the that, yep. but, the, but the piece that we can do something about is to limit the exposure to screen time to get, like, I think Apex, you know, makes a blue block or something that, you know, kind of goes around your eyes so the light isn't all stick in the side. Mm. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and to create an environment at least at home where our sleep is protected with the dark shades if we need to. And uh, as with everything else we do, and uh, you know, as with everything we do, being conscious of it, mm-hmm. of our uh, actions and the effects of our actions, uh, is always helpful. Thinking okay. about light is one of those things, and certainly device use. Yeah. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. We really appreciate your call. Talk to you then. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. And this is Let's Talk Call-In Radio. Uh, the number is 415-663-8492 or 663-8317. And uh, this is KWMR in Point Ray Station. And we'd like to thank the Station House Cafe for being one of our wonderful underwriters. Serving breakfast, lunch, and dinner in downtown Point Reyes Station since 1974, the Station House Cafe is a proud supporter of KWMR and all things local, offering live music, garden dining, cocktails, and more. Information and reservations available at 415-663-1515 or online at stationhousecafe.com. And we're also, of course, supported by our listeners, our Calendar Club members, and by Rancho Nicasio, a historic roadhouse featuring live music Friday and Saturday nights and Sunday afternoons on the town square in Nicasio, offering a daily lunch and dinner and weekend brunch. Inquiries about weddings, private parties, and corporate events available online at ranchonicasio.com. That's R-A-N-C-H-O-N-I-C-A-S-I-O dot Com. And we also like to thank the Pacific Sun, Marin's Arts and News Weekly, online at pacificsun.com. And as I said, this is Let's Talk, and we're talking about light pollution, and we're joined in the studio by an additional co-host, Sebastian Alvarez. Good day, sir. Hello. How are you? Am I? Uh, can I hear myself? I is don't it? know. Can you? Can you? I <laughs> turned up your headphones ah, so you great. could. Okay. You're well, doing very well. It's okay. Um, well, uh, yeah. It's. It's. I noticed that you were already looking at the IDA uh, page, uh, so I assume you were talking about... Uh, IDA, the uh-huh. uh, International Dark Sky Association, which has a very informative wor- website at darksky.org. And it's uh, full of, of great information. Yeah, yeah. I, I was just thinking about the r- recent call and uh, the talk about the screen. Uh, it made me think about a film, a short film that I recently saw by a um, uh, forget, British artist called Lisa Rafe, and she made a film called Europium. Hmm. And in this film, she talks about how the light that emanates from our L- uh, LCD screens uh, and our computers comes from a mineral called europium that is extracted from these shells that exist on the bottom of the ocean. And, you know, these shells um, uh, a century ago used to be used uh, uh, by aboriginals in in Australia as ways of predicting the future. Um, And, you know, anthropologists (laughs) saw this as a sort of primitive ritual, you know. And ironically, later on, this is all what we use in order to make our screens bright and predict our future. <laughs> That's futures. amazing. Yeah. Europium. Yeah. I, I think it's also used to, uh, for the Euro bills and, you know, many other, <laughs> because it has this sort of luminescence. Oh, uh, really? Mm-hmm. Well, seashells. Well, along those lines of uh, making a reference to film, I was thinking about this, too. There's this, 
I think we might look back in our culture and think of a pragmatic slash even romanticized version of uh, illuminating the light, uh, the illuminating the night sky. So you have mm. those big giant Klieg lights that you would aim up at the sky, and then in wartime, mm. and you'd like shoot at the planes. Well, this is what planes, I've yeah. seen in movies, right. and then. And then also at openings, at these fabulous grand openings of films, and of uh, course, especially in the heyday of Hollywood, where you had all the movie stars, the, the luminaries on, on, on the ground, and then you'd have these big Klieg lights shining up right. uh, to commemorate the that this is where it's happening. Right. And there's sort of this, that's a more discretionary fanfare-like use of... Mm the night sky messing with the night sky of course at the ruins of the twin towers there were two huge shafts of, blue light shafts of light aimed yeah. up yeah it's, uh, uh, it's i know I it died. used to be it used to be that those lights would be uh you'd see them from miles away but i'm guessing they're they're less effective now in la for example because you just wouldn't see them Against the glow uh, of the city. Yeah, and that's where it was, you know, <laughs> between that and New York City where the lights. And, and, and then this is the, the silliest application of this same thing I'm talking about is, and the most comic book romanticization, whatever, if that's a real word, mm. uh, is the bat <laughs> in Gotham City shining up the big oh, the light signal. with the bat signal. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you wouldn't see that anymore either. Yeah. He'd be out of luck. He, you'd have to just call him on his cell. <laughs> on his you'd have cell. to just text Batman. Exactly. It's actually because, I mean, if, if I think of Batman, uh, was Batman supposed to be in Chicago, right? He's inspired by Chicago City and somehow Gotham is inspired by Chicago. And I remember when I used to live there, uh, so many of the buildings in Michigan Avenue, which are mostly concrete, were all illuminated. And I used to wonder... When did this start? It? Mm. You know, when, like, I, I, I know that some buildings are all glass and the light emanates from within them. And so I was wondering when did buildings start being illuminated from the outside? And, mm. and sort of the amount of concrete that these buildings have, uh, uh, they have more concrete than windows, right? Mm. So the building has to be illuminated. And so you have this huge presence as you walk to the street, like these, like, rectangles that are, like, you know. Giant. That's interesting. Well, and of course, in Chicago, the a big problem with the big buildings that are lit up at night in Chicago is the bird strikes during mm -hmm. migrations, because that's a huge migratory flyway, and mm -hmm. there are thousands of bird strikes per building. Wow. Oh, that's migration. terrible. Um, yeah. Oh, that's you know, I don't know they're why they're so disoriented. That... They're flying at night. And yeah. Like, and we don't really. Put a value on that. Well, let's talk about putting a value on it. Thirteen percent of residential electricity use in the U.S. is for outdoor lighting. Uh, bad outdoor lighting in the average house. Bad outdoor lighting wastes a half a kilowatt hour of energy per house per night. Uh, that's enough to power your uh, fifty-inch TV for an hour. Okay, so we're wasting light there. Uh, about 15 million tons of CO2 are emitted each year in order to power residential outdoor lighting in the U.S. About 35% of that light is wasted by unshielded and or poorly aimed outdoor lighting. Uh, this is about 3 billion, billion with a B, per year's worth of energy lost to sky glow. You're just lighting up the sky instead of as well as lighting up the ground, you're just lighting up the sky. From reflection, from badly shielded lights, from uh, from just bad design of lights. You know, these there are those street lights that we see in sort of ornamental, old-timey street lights that are just big white globes with no tops on them. Uh, in sort of older section, downtown, old town, that kind of thing happens but all these uh, all these lights especially as i said the led lights now are so cheap to run that they're putting more of them in and they're emitting mostly blue light and they're also uh, brighter they're uh, and they're still unshielded the, the light fittings are mainly unshielded unless they pay extra for the properly shielded light how do plants respond to being put under those blue lights is what i'm interested in mm. Like grow lights that maybe LED and right. 
Can you make can you make an LED light that is a full spectrum light, for example? And maybe oh, yeah. this is a little off the. Topic. Oh, I think so. I, don't know. I think uh, LEDs they can play play with them and emit any wavelength they want, can't they? Nothing's off topic, by the way. In this conversation. So I saw this really cute purse. Oh, wait. <laughs> How did you see it? Was it a night? Uh-huh. I had a night viewing of a really cute purse. Actually, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, you go. I mean, I, I was just thinking that right, right this example of the purse and looking to a vitrine, and, and I was just thinking about what really moves people to cities, right? And like the, the, the cultural allure of cities. And, mm. you know, I remember a, a while ago I did a photographic series called Photo Taxis. And you know what Photo Taxis is? It's, um, at, you know, um, all of living beings and creatures um, have a tendency to move towards or uh, or uh, from the light. Mm-hmm. You, they either are attracted or repelled by light. So there's like negative and positive phototaxis. And moths, for instance, they will fly towards the light and to immolate themselves and die you know, in, mm-hmm. the, uh, in the sunlight of the artificial light. And then roaches, they will escape from the light. I mean, as soon as you open a door, you see a roach looking for a shadow. Skedaddles, mm-hmm. yeah. So to me, that was an interesting, uh, you know, uh, metaphor to think about, you know, how, you know, humans are constantly looking for light and knowledge and all this sort of like, you know, are attracted always by the allure of cultural life at night, you know? And then, you know... We justify this lighting on the streets by safety. Mm -hmm. Ah. And uh, studies have done it. turns out uh, that this does not make places safer. That's right. That's interesting, isn't it? That was another part, another reason I did this. A 2015 study published in the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health found that streetlights don't prevent accidents or crime, but do cost a lot of money. They looked at road traffic collisions and crime. This is in England and Wales. In 62 local authorities in England and Wales found that lighting had no effect whether authorities turned them off, dimmed them, turned them off at certain hours, or substituted low-power low power LED lamps. Uh, they can re- local authorities can safely reduce street lighting, saving both costs and energy without necessarily impacting negatively upon road ca- traffic collisions and crime. Uh, another study in London. There's no good evidence that increased lighting reduces total crime. Uh, very little confidence that improved lighting prevents crime. Uh, the truth is bad outdoor lighting can decrease safety by making victims and property easier to see, of course, <laughs> which is something uh, something that I always thought about as we were, used to take walks around uh, San Anselmo, uh, all the lights, all the houses had outdoor lights on them, bright outdoor lights, mostly not downward. They were just kind of broadcasting light. Uh, and I thought, well, if I was going to burgle this place and there's no other lights on in the house and there's just this big bright light right by the front door, how easy to get in. Anyway, we have a caller. Hi, caller, you're on the air. What's your name? And keep it clean, please. Hi, this is Gail. Gail again. Uh, yes, Gail. Hello. <laughs> Gail again. Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, I just had another thought huh? and a question, actually. I don't know if you might know the answer. Um, you know, when I people talk about overpopulation or how the population of the United States is increasing and how it will all be handled, but when, when I've been fly a lot, you know, especially when my mom was ill, and across the country there is an astonishing amount of geographic area in this country, and certainly if you look towards Canada, you know, that is unpopulated. Mm-hmm. And so the one statistic which we didn't, couldn't really find this morning is, you know, 80% of the population lives in light, flooded areas, but I wonder what percentage of the United States is geographically is lit actually dark or, hmm. or dark. And it also makes me wonder, you know, like you say, you can see the lights 150 miles away. So, I mean, of that uninhabited or, or lightly, you know, sparsely populated areas, still, you know, I wonder what the radius is of, of light that, mm. you know, of places that are impacted by that light, even though they may be very little in the way of lights locally. Yeah, that's an interesting... That's a good, yeah, that's a good question. Um, because, of course, Las Vegas, which was the example that we had given, which which <laughs> the lights of which are visible from uh, the north rim of the, the Grand, Grand Canyon. Canyon, I mean, that's an extreme... I would call that an extreme example because, 
you know, there are just huge, massive banks of <laughs> lights in Las Vegas just f- mm. for the reason of... It's Las Vegas. <laughs> ...of it being a spectacle, spectacular. Right. Right. And probably those radiating, you know, searchlights that you were kind of talking about before, too. You know, the ones, the marquees. The Klieg lights, yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, that I... You know, I've, I have not come across an actual, I mean, I've seen pictures, photos taken from space of uh, lights, and they've put them all together, and uh, they show the Earth all lit up. But, of course, there are massive dark areas there, too. But It's funny, actually, now that you it? mentioned this, it reminds me that during the presidential elections, you know, there were all these statistical maps of who was voting for Trump or not. Mm-hmm. And it was, ironically, it was in all the dark areas which people was voting there for Trump. There you go. <laughs> that mm-hmm. explains a lot. It, <laughs> that's really, and, and, and speaking of politics, I'm thinking of nationalism as a reason for illumination of buildings as well. National pride and nationalism. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, the Twin Towers having been memorialized by these two lights, these beams of light, but also in Paris, uh, the the Eiffel Tower, that is also, that's not only nationalism, but that's also spectacle. Uh, It's not enough that we can marvel over the Eiffel Tower, which for me, the compelling reason to go there is there's a really good restaurant in there. But um, <laughs> but but then they have a light show at night, and so you can see it from all over the city and so forth. Uh, so that's, that's okay. another, you know, compelling reason that cities sort of, um, I don't know, put, put forth their own self-love um, and self-fabulousness. Well, you know, people tend to like it because when we were traveling in Spain, you know, they would say, oh, and there's an incredible, they light up the fountains at night at the Mesquite or, you know, whatever the mm. famous buildings are because they attract people. I mean, light attracts yeah. people. And and what about in religion, you know, in Judaism, they have the eternal light. I mean, that's how you kind of represent that someone is present and paying attention and honoring this mm. you know, yes. all the time. And the um, so eternal flame for the unknown soldier. But at that least burns. it's a flame. <laughs> it's a flame. It gives me a little anxiety. <laughs> not a not a blue LED. It's not yet. Anyway. Not yet. <laughs> All right. um, yeah. I, hey there. Anyway, well, thank you, Gail. That's uh, Carry on. good points. I hadn't. Uh, I I have no figures about um, the spread of light pollution. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Gail. I see I'm... 663-415-663-8492. Give us a call, won't you? I just have been looking at this New Yorker article, and it is it is a few years old, but it, it says uh, that, that um, the California Department of Transportation has been diminishing the level of nighttime lighting. They found that that can increase visibility and then mm. in recent years the 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 department has greatly reduced its use of continuous lighting on its highways and has increased its use of reflectors and other passive guides great so Thank that that Cal actually Times. and that has an effect on air, airport runways and um and and people driving on the roads and it right. increases visibility so yeah the the ironic the it seems like a an ironic thing is that the brighter the lights, the more glare, the more dangerous it is Three to minutes. drive a car. Hi, caller, you're on the air. What's your name, please? My name is David. David. Hello, oh, David. Watch, watch my language, of course. Please do. Um, I, I didn't hear all of Peggy's co- uh, comments earlier. Mm. I was uh, busy with someone in the store, but um, I have a sleep mask, and it's, you know, a four dollar sleep mask that i got off the internet and Mm. the light pollution around uh late june is nasty you know it it starts to get light at five o'clock in the morning and it's uh and i wake up at a quarter to five and i can't get back (laughs) to sleep and but i have a sleep mask that does everything that i need to block out light including all those little voodoo lights that uh all my powered appliances give off, which I oh, yes. try and cover up. But um, 
you know, it's a it's a four dollar thing. It's just a piece of foam that has some elastic on the back, and it mm-hmm. works fabulously. That's very. Uh, there you go. If you're having trouble, I'm sure uh, everyone at uh, Walnut Place will be donning yeah, their sleep. Mask. I say they got to en masse a go for blackout curtains because sometimes. Um, for me, for example, I, I get a little claustrophobic. I have one of those too, David, and and it makes me a tad claustrophobic to uh-huh. wear a mask like that. Uh, but I was also thinking about the little lights, the little the, that you call them voodoo lights. I love that. Is that really a term that you made up, or is that an official term? I think it's an official term. It's voodoo vampire lights. Are they just something. those vampire. lights drive me nuts? Vampire lights. They I, suck energy. I yeah. put electrical tape over them. Yep. Yeah, they're, those are demonic. It's true. They light up <laughs> my little little cabin at night, uh, and it, uh, I just I do the same thing. Mm. Black electrical tape works good. There you go. Um, I've been camping a lot uh, over the years, and sometimes people pull up to a campsite and with their land yachts, and which are you know that they're running a generator all night. Mm-hmm. So there's sound pollution. Would you go to camping to get away from all this? And then they have, they put up, they install their own spotlights. Mm. And I'm, I'm in my little lowly camper van. Mm. Uh, and I'm just going, oh, my God, do I go tell them? You know, what is the etiquette? Are they going to tell me to put it where the sun doesn't shine, but so where, how where there's constant illumination all night? Go look at a recent cover of The New Yorker that has... Uh, some campers on the cover and it's about playing safe uh camping safely or mm. safe travels i think is what it's called and there's a city family who's putting uh life jackets on their kids for their canoes and the camp next to them uh, the camper next to them has a gun rack and a, you know a shotgun razor wire that's his idea of uh, safely yeah yeah it, it's funny now that I hear you like mentioning the New Yorker. Also, this reminds me that I was recently in New York, and a friend invited me to a bar, in which uh, they uh, hushed you every time you spoke loudly, and they were very concerned with sonic pollution in this bar. Hmm. And I was wondering, is there a bar for visual pollution in which you know the lights are really dim and? You know, well, like, it used oh, to be bars, yeah. like, be bars kind of were like dark. that, <laughs> and that's you that's know to make everybody look good at two a.m. <laughs> exactly, and those wonderful deep high naugahyde booths, and they were. Uh. I mean, I long for those. Like, where are those cool old? They're all kind of gone now. Yeah, brightly lit and noisy. That's and and there are restaurants that actually uh, there's one in town that uh, has is all hard surfaces, and it's way mm-hmm. too loud for me, and mm-hmm. that's intentional. They, they, um, there's a theory, apparently it works because a lot of restaurants subscribe to it, mm. that a loud venue is attractive and interesting to people. Yeah. There's a lot of noise there. Don't like it. So. Cold as well. <laughs> Pardon? Cold. Cold. Yeah, they intentionally make grocery stores cold. If I'm oh, well. Uh, and, uh, and medical offices. But, yeah, thank you, David. That was... Uh, you're so welcome. That was a very good call. Thank you so much. <laughs> we appreciate it. David, um, let's not forget the poor astronomers. The beleaguered astronomer. <laughs> the beleaguered astronomers who are trying to find dark spots in the sky where they can actually... Yes, what they wish they were in the 1600s, like Galileo. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, uh, well, I, I was... When you're talking about campsites, it makes me wonder how much of lighting up the sky, lighting up a campsite, apart from it, you know, supposedly making them safer, but uh, apparently not. That's what flashlights are for. Partly because, oh, by the way, but you're not safer also because lighting creates darker shadows or more contrast so there are deeper darker shadows that people can hide in and watch you as you're walking down the lighted stream but anyway uh, i wonder how much of it is to do with shutting out nature actually seems weird but you know you were talking about a a Mm -hmm. big rv out it's always affiliated with a really big old rv the bigger the rv the more likely there is to be a floodlight that goes all night like i can understand having some lights some atmospheric lights around your campsite maybe here and there so that you can sort of 
I don't know, have a festive atmosphere. But mm-hmm. turn that off at at and bedtime. Really, yeah. I mean, what are you thinking? It's a very clueless. Well, the campsites um, have rules about that, though, don't they? The, mm. the 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 light, the brighter the all night illumination, the dimmer the camper. Oh, yeah. As to your point, Sebastian. Now, is that causation or? <laughs> <laughs> I think like you just you just mentioned the word astronomer, and right away I thought about this again and bringing external references from the art world. But uh, the the film Nostalgia for the Light. Have you seen it? This is a fascinating film by a Chilean uh, filmmaker called Patricio Guzman, and oh. it was released in 2010, um, and it basically focused on the similarities between astronomers uh, uh, researching the humanities uh, past in the Atacama Desert, mm. uh, because it's, you know, it's one of the darkest skies out there, right? It's probably one of the... It's very dry, there's no humidity, so they have these huge dark skies in which they can observe celestial events. And the film compares uh, the, these astronomers looking for the deep time humanity, I mean, for responses to, um, to trying to understand deep time, and also this group of mothers who are um, looking for the, um, you know, uh, the, the remnants of, the, of their, their children. children who were yeah. disappeared during the Pinochet dictatorship. So mm-hmm. you find these women walking like uh, uh, looking for their, their children in the desert and then these astronomers looking for a wow. deeper time uh, mm-hmm. looking up the sky. You know, it's fascinating we, how he draws these comparisons. It's very poetic and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and challenging to watch. But Fabulous place, yeah. Atacama Desert. Yeah. My goodness. Clearest sky in the world. Is that right? Because it's high and... Yeah, and it's, it's cold. It's, it's it's not high. Yeah, it's cold. It's it's uh, it's very dry, and so there's no humidity. You can really clear have a mm. clear lenses to look at the sky, and and it's one of the dark skies uh, sanctuaries. Mm. Right? Like there are. Like I think it'd be so exciting to go there. I mm-hmm. definitely want to put that on the list. Mm-hmm. Me too. Field trip. Field trip. Atacama Desert. <laughs> Anyone? Sign up now. Uh, yeah, a dark sky is a beautiful thing to behold, and it's uh, it's all part of our evolution. If we, uh, what happens if you can't see the sky anymore? All you can see is the loom of a of where you live. I, I don't know. It's uh, it's probably bad for mental health, bad for physical health. And uh, and bad for wildlife. Let's just say, mm-hmm. uh, for example, Florida. There are some there are some waterfront towns in Florida that are actually prohibiting uh, lights at the edges of the beaches now because the turtles that were heading inland because they thought that was the glow oh. of the the moon on the water. Right. Oh. So they're <laughs> going across the beach and across the the highway. That's heartbreaking. That and it was a hot dog sign. <laughs> it was a hot dog sign. <laughs> Turtle soup. Um, oh. So, it, it's, uh, yes, light pollution. It's just well, another one of those adjustments things. are being made. Is there probably are not enough, nearly enough, but some adjustments, some <laughs> awareness. Yes, I think the darkest place in the planet is the Mariana... Uh, Trench? Trench. Oh, the deepest spot in the ocean. Yes. 35,000... Yes. Uh, can't see the sky yeah. from there, though. <laughs> it is very dark. Well, I would like to say thank you, Sally. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Sebastian. Thank it's you. the three S's in front of me. Sebastian, Sally, and Stephen. And I'm Paul Raphael. Thank you to all our callers and uh, our, all our listeners out there. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. KWMR does not take a stand on any of the issues discussed on Let's Talk. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the hosts and callers and don't necessarily reflect the views of KWMR, its board of directors, underwriters, or members. And um, we'll be back next week, I think, won't we? We're still here next week. Yes, we will be off somewhere at some point. But um, we'll be back next Thursday. Meanwhile... Here's something from uh, Richard Thompson. Shoot out the lights. Bye, everybody.